Thank you. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, good. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Mark Anderson. I'm a gag cartoonist, and I run a website called andertoons.com. Uh, my presentation is entitled, I Don't Know, Give It a Try, See What Happens. Uh, I want to thank you first for having me. I want to thank uh, Tom Richmond for uh, being the first one to invite me. Uh, the NCS and, and John for, for making all of the arrangements and making uh, everything work and finding the correct adapters and, and all of that good stuff. And thank you all for coming to listen. I'm not sure everyone here is familiar with my work, so why don't we start with a few uh, more recent examples. Serendipity is up, Fluke is doing well, but I'm a little concerned about our dumb luck. I do a lot of graph cartoons because I sell a lot of business publications. Uh, you'd think you'd, you'd start to run out of graph cartoons after a while, but I don't, I don't seem to. Carl here is the personification of death. Tell him about your scythe, honey. For some reason, I think the, uh, naming the Grim Reaper Carl makes that cartoon for me. Arrows are not for everyone. Side effects may include romance, passion, feelings of love, dizziness, headaches, and nausea. Ask your doctor if an arrow in the heart is right for you. I had to do a lot of research on drug commercial disclaimer language to, to get that one to play right. It was like a, a wasted hour, but uh, it came out pretty well. Let's focus instead on the root cause. Nature, perhaps. Nurture, mmm, makes you think, doesn't it? I think, I don't like to italicize words in a caption, but I think that one makes that work. Oh, that's just the looming specter of dwindling profits. Just ignore him. I ran across that phrase in a, a newspaper, and uh, that one just sort of wrote itself. Sharon wants to talk about last month's sales figures. We've got that conference call at 3, and Phil apparently ran afoul of a trap in the supply closet, so we need to hire a temp until we can get somebody new. Uh, when I'm stuck for an idea, I put animals in an office to see what happens. I believe I'm on record saying this is completely the wrong approach. I'm also on the record saying this is the smartest way to go. So I've got my bases covered. Next question. Uh, I don't do a lot of political stuff, so as not to piss off 50% of my audience. But uh, when I do, I try to stay pretty general. Some people golf. Some people play racquetball. But I find if you really want to know what makes someone tick, nothing beats a ball pit. I was doing a cartoon for a client about odd places to have job interviews. And they rejected this one. And I was really pleased that they did. Because then I get to use it. I'm exhausted. That kid is like a well magnet. <laughs> I don't do a lot of specific breeds of dogs. I have sort of a generic dog that I use. But uh, i got to say, that's not a bad collie. I'm pretty proud of that one. It's a transformative piece, touching on themes of joy, desire, loss, and fourth quarter earnings. It's another take on the graph cartoon. I was reading a review of an art exhibit in the Trib, and I lifted most of this caption from the art review. It was just so pretentious, I couldn't help but make fun of it. I keep trying to work on that report, but I can't help curling up and napping on this damn thing. <laughs> I know cats do this. Mine don't, though. They stay away from the laptop, so I actually... I was second guessing myself, and I had to go on the internet and go, like, cats sleeping on laptops. Is this a thing? And apparently it is. So uh, I did my due diligence, and I'm, I'm proud of that. Looks like our time is up, so let's bottle that all back up until next week. <laughs> that guy, I feel really bad for him. <clears throat> because I used a permanent marker, this is the play we're going with until Terry gets back from the office supply store with a new whiteboard. I was, just, I was talking with Mike Lynch on the bus, and I was making jokes using the name Terry. I don't know why, but Terry is funny. Uh, I don't know a lot about sports, especially football, so every time I do one of these, which is not that often, I have to look up plays to see like, and make sure that I get them right and that they look right and that they're visually interesting. It's always kind of a hassle. Actually, ninjas multiply fractions all the time. They just never talk about it because they're ninjas. My wife is a teacher, and I do a lot of teacher cartoons for magazines. She likes this one. That makes, this one makes her laugh. I know brevity is wit and all that, but sometimes you just need a long caption, so everybody strap in for this one. Let's try a little role-playing. Tom, you're upset that Susan has changed the thermostat. Susan, you're an accountant struggling with unresolved issues with your estranged father that moonlights as a sexy, fast-talking private detective, all the while harboring the awful secret that you, Susan, are also a vampire. Go! 
Now that you know a little bit about my work, uh, let's get down to it. I had to admit, uh, it's a little bit difficult to know exactly where to pitch this talk. I've done a couple of the success in comic seminars with the guys at Tundra. Uh, those are more geared towards aspiring cartoonists, uh, and this certainly isn't a more general audience. Uh, it's the NCS and the Rubens, no less. So I tried to really pitch it like at an appropriate level, and I hope I did. So let's begin with what I am not going to tell you. I'm not going to talk about the current state of newspapers or syndication. Uh, it's all been said on both sides more times than I care to remember. Uh, I don't have anything to add. I'm not going to talk about web comics. I'm not going to talk about whether they're the way to go or the end of comics as we know it. It's not my business model, so I'm also not going to talk about Kickfunder or crowdfund uh, Kickstarter or crowdfunding. I've purchased products this way. Again, not my business model. What I am going to tell you is how I quit my job, became a stay-at-home dad, and built a thriving business selling my cartoons online with a deceptively simple philosophy. There's just three little parts, and it's really easy. I don't know. Give it a try. See what happens. That's really all there is to it, but it served me pretty well. Let's start at the beginning with I don't know. Uh, this pairs pretty nicely with a look at who I was before I knew I wanted to be a cartoonist. I grew up in Iowa. I was the youngest of four kids. Here's me. No awe. There's not a single awe out there. Oh, thank you. That makes me feel good. I was expecting an awe. I was like, and I told my ears, where they'll awe, and I'll pause. <clears throat> Here's a photo I took of myself with my grandmother's camp. Thank you. Aw, oh, you guys are the best. Uh, I took this with my grandma's camera while she was going, no, don't touch that button. <laughs> uh, growing up, I loved three things. I loved Lego, of course, everyone knows that. Music, and I loved cartoons. This is uh, an elementary school project I did called Little Leather Riding Hood. I'll read it to you. Uh, Little Red Riding Hood is apparently in this book a biker chick with nunchucks that beats up the wolf. <clears throat> I'll, I'll read she got up to dust off all the dirt out of her hood when she saw a wolf. What do you want, you old bag of bones? She snapped. Why, I came to see if you were all right, dearie. Yeah, I'm just fine. Get away from me. I'm on my way to Grandma's pad for a rumble. Here, let me help you. You touch the leather bub. You eat it. And with that, she vroomed away. Teachers did not care for this. Kids loved this. <laughs> Classmates, they were pretty sure. They're like, hey, Anderson's all right. Uh, I also did uh, cartoons for my high school paper. Our mascot was a lancer. It's like a knight with the long, pointy uh, spear. So I did a, a comic with a knight and a dragon and whatnot. Uh, the dragon here saying, what you got there? Ham sandwich. Hand it over. Why should I? Oh, I don't know. Just the fact that I could sizzle you to a crisp. And then the, he's eating the sandwich. Persuasion is one of those things dragons do best. Yeah, I know. It's a high school and it's not that good. <laughs> I also did some editorial cartoons for the paper. Uh, this is uh, one of my early, early attempts. Do you know me? I ruled the Philippines for 20 years with an iron fist. That's why I, Ferdinand Marcos, carry the Philippine Express card. It's recognized in Australia, Russia, even Hawaii. The Philippine Express card. I couldn't have resigned without it. That's an old commercial. I showed this to my kids, and they had no idea what I was talking about. My son's like, what is that? Never mind. So here's me drawing cartoons for my high school. You don't have to awe at this one. I'm not that cute. No, oh, you guys are sweet. <laughs> and who is probably better? Uh, my influences growing up included, of course, Charles Schultz. George Carlin, I really loved, although a lot of his records weren't appropriate for me to be listening to. Uh, my sister had him, and I loved his wordplay and the way that he used uh, uh, language. I still do. Marvel, of course, loved Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Bill Watterson. I made this a couple months ago, and then I didn't know when Letterman was retiring. Uh, so it seems a little weird doing it like right after he retired, but he was a huge influence on me. I, used to, I had a little TV in my room, and I'd stay up and watch Letterman late at night. Don Martin, of course, uh, Berkeley Brethren, and uh, Bill Host. Uh, at the end of high school, they gave me this test that's supposed to tell you what careers you would be good at. I ended up with two. Garbage man professional dancer. And you can tell I'm not suited really. I'm suited for one maybe. Professional dancer, no. 
Uh, although I briefly considered a career as a dancing garbage man, I decided to go to school at Illinois Wesleyan University where I studied music, specifically the trombone. After a few years, as uh, people that age uh, pretty much uh, think, that I was sure that I knew everything, and I dropped out early, and I played trombone on uh, cruise ships for a couple years. I traveled the world and got some, uh, some real life lessons. Uh, but after you've been to the Bahamas about 150 times, it gets really, really old. You wouldn't think it would, but it does. Uh, so I went back to school. I finished up my music degree at the University of Northern Iowa. After school, I moved to Chicago, married my college sweetheart, and put my music degree to work at my very first adult job, Kmart. Fantastic. Just what I went to school for. Uh, working and playing music uh, like at night was difficult, uh, so I, I hung up my trombone, and uh, blue light specials were not that exciting. And I started thinking about cartoons again. And although I clearly had no idea what I was doing, I figured I'd give it a try. Now, this isn't something, as, as everyone knows, this isn't something you just start doing full-time, full-tilt. So I still had to work other jobs. After a few more months at Kmart, I landed a job at a company that manufactured tiny screws. Uh, there wasn't a lot of money there, but it was a good business education. I didn't know an invoice from a purchase order, but this was a good way to learn that. And I started working from my living room coffee table. I used uh, Sharpies and copier paper, and I read every cartoon collection and every cartoon and how book, a how-to book in every library in the state. Uh, I was... Uh, Interlibrary loan was my best friend. The librarians hated me when they saw me coming. Uh, I was at this time further influenced by other cartoons and cartoonists, including, of course, Matt Groening and The Simpsons, Peter Arno, uh, of course, Charles Adams, Henry Martin, love Henry Martin, uh, Sidney Harris, Sean Day, probably the biggest, uh, one of the biggest influences on me. I just love his work. Uh, Leo Cullum, and of course, Jack Ziegler. And around this time, I also began to look at the business side of cartooning. I got my hands on the artist and graphic designers market, your career in the comics. I read that book cover to cover a good dozen times. Uh, and cartoonist profiles. I loved that magazine. That was a great one. Uh, and I soon realized that magazines were probably my best shot at breaking into cartooning. So I was back to the library to research who was buying, what they bought, and how much they paid. And I started sending out packets of cartoons. My first rejection came back from the magazine for the ASPCA. Uh, I don't know why I thought it was a good idea to send it. I'll tell you the cartoon. It's a wolf. And the wolf has his leg caught in a bear trap, one of those big tats with the big teeth that comes up. And he's caught, and there's another wolf talking to him. And the wolf in the trap says, no, it's OK. I'll gnaw off my own leg. Thanks. <laughs> Why? Why would you send that there? <laughs> Who thought that was, that was a terrible idea? Uh, they sent a very nice, we not, we're not sure this is right for us. Please, please try other markets. Uh, my research and persistence and better taste in writing paid off, and it wasn't too much longer before I got my very first sale to the Funny Times in January of 1999 for a, a whole whopping 20 bucks. Here's the, the cartoon. It's a couple of dogs in a lab, and they're doing equations and chemistry. And it says, in search of dog nip. It's sort of a, a far sighty cartoon. Uh, I, so I sold it to them in January, but I had to wait 11 months until they published it. They didn't publish it until November, which drove me insane. I was sure, I didn't, I didn't know how it worked, but I assumed once they bought it, the next month I'm gonna see it in print, right? No, of course not, it doesn't work. I called them like every month, I was like, uh, hi, this is Mark Anderson, you bought this cartoon, um, do you know when you're going to, they're like, no, we don't, we have no idea when we're going to, when we have a page full of dog cartoons, and I'd call that, um, hi, I just wanted to check, uh, but once I did see it in print, I was hooked, uh, and after a few years and uh, more occasional sales, I quit my job at the screw factory and moved to a metal coil distributorship, you can mark that one off my bucket list, all right. <laughs> Uh, around this time, I started selling more regularly to magazines like Reader's Digest. Medical Economics was a good customer. Harvard Business Review bought a lot for me. Uh, the New Breed was fantastic for an, an up-and-coming cartoonist. I, I sold a lot of them. They were very kind to me. 
uh, brand week. Good housekeeping, I sold a ton to, and sort of taught myself how to color in the process. Saturday Evening Post, and of course Forbes. Forbes was great. The place where I worked, the metal coil place, was everybody there was striving. They all wanted to be super business people, and they wanted write-ups in the paper, and, and, and the best part was Forbes was always in the lobby uh, on the little table there where like salesmen would come in and wait. And I was in Forbes. Like everybody in, in the business was like, I'm gonna make it, we're gonna do it. This is gonna be we're gonna be a billion dollar company. And like little Mark sitting back in customer service has is, I'm the guy in Forbes. <laughs> Nobody else cared. I felt very good about that. Uh, of course there was plenty of rejection. Uh, I was also trying syndication around this time. We'll get into more on that later. Uh, it was around this time that I talked my wife into our very first computer. Uh, it was a terrible sales job I did with my wife. I believe my sales pitch was, I don't know, I just want one. I think it would be fun, and you can play games on them. <laughs> I know, isn't that terrible? Um, but once I had one, once I just beat it until it's like, she's like, fine, just buy one. Uh, I soon figured out it would be a good idea to start putting my cartoons online and start selling them here. So I created my very first website, built it myself, as you can probably tell. Uh, it wasn't too much longer after that I was downsized out of my job at the Metal Coil Distributorship, and I went to work for Autotrader.com. Now, this was my last non-cartooning job, and it was here that my personal and subsequently professional life took a big turn my wife and I found out that we were expecting our first child. And while this was, of course, terrifying, it also created an unexpected opportunity. Uh, we both knew that we wanted someone to stay at home when we had kids. My wife is a teacher, and she had much better job security than I did. I hated my job. Uh, cartooning was small but steady, so we took a leap of faith. Uh, the plan was that I would quit my job, become a stay-at-home dad, which, by the way, I also knew nothing about, and become a cartoonist. Uh, I still had a few months left at Auto Trader, and I did as little real work as possible uh, and worked feverishly on my website. I worked on my database, uh, entering captions and keywords and, and what have you. The nice thing about this is that spreadsheets all pretty much look the same when you're in a cubicle and they're just walking by. They can't tell what you're working on. They said, oh, spreadsheet, nice job, good for you. Uh, I was also researching uh, SEO. Uh, I set up some e-commerce on the website to automate sales. And I started doing custom cartoons. And all this I'll get into more detail about in just a minute. After my son was born, I quit my job and got down to it. Yeah, <laughs> I had it all. Uh, I was balancing a baby and cartooning, and it was difficult, but despite what almost everyone said, which was that this could you couldn't do this, it wouldn't work. Uh, but it did work, and so well, in fact, that a few years later, my wife and I decided to up the ante, and we had our daughter. Uh, I stayed home for a good decade uh, with the kids, and I built a cartoon career slowly during nap time, and preschool, and Sesame Street. And I kept working on my cartoons and my website, improving them both over time, slowly but surely. Surprisingly, my previous jobs, while not fun or exciting, prepared me well for handling rejection, dealing with customers, and selling an online product. Uh, it was a trying time, like literally and figuratively, and I tried all kinds of things, both as a stay-at-home dad and as a cartoonist. But after 10 years, it really kind of paid off. So now we get to get to the fun stuff. Let's see what happened. Uh, I don't work at a coffee table anymore, I have a small office downstairs in our house. Both the kids are old enough to be in school full-time now, so that uh, gives me time and I can draw cartoons full-time. I have a little bit of help. I have some people that help with social media. I have a guy that helps with some of the shading. Uh, I have a couple of developers, an accountant. But pretty much it's still a one-man show, uh, and business is good. Turns out that I did some things right. But before we get into what worked, here's a disclaimer. I grew up in the Midwest where we're not where we're raised to not talk about ourselves. But the whole point of me being here is to talk about myself. So let me say this, I've had some success, I'm gonna tell you about it, but I've tried very hard to craft the tone of this part to come off as informational and not Mark's up here bragging about himself. So let's get down to what worked. The big thing obviously that worked was my website, andertunes.com. 
Every cartoon I create goes here. And after about 10 years, there's about 3,000 cartoons. I also use the website to market my custom cartoon services. And it has a pretty extensive log. Let's look under the hood. Uh, Google Analytics here. I created this back in March, so the data that we're going to be looking at from here on is from March 2014 to March 2015. In that time, I had 1.5 million page views, averaging about 130,000 a month or about 4,000 a day. Now, that comes from uh, about 400,000 users, 34,000 in a month, just about 1,100 a day. Now, this is a relatively small amount of traffic. When you compare this to uh, like popular web comics like, uh, like PVP or, or Penny Arcade, those guys get millions and millions and millions of page views. But with this small amount of traffic, I make a pretty good living. And the reason why, I think, is because I try to think about the user first. And I make things as easy for them as possible. For example, I make my inventory searchable. Here's the home page. So you can type in dog or Twitter or photosynthesis, whatever. You're probably going to get something. And that's all thanks to that database that I built at my last job. Now, your results show up like this. There's a, a, a grid of thumbnails. When you move your mouse over a thumbnail, a larger image pops up. And when you click on that, you're taken to a page where you can buy the cartoon. Searching is pretty easy and quick and intuitive for the user. Uh, cartoons are also organized into about a dozen major topics, each of which has its own landing page. Uh, this helps with search engines and bring the, uh, brings me to the next thing I did right, which is SEO, or search engine optimization. This is a way of setting up and organizing your pages so that they read well to Google and Bing and Yahoo. This is way harder now than it was when I, I set things up. Google is almost constantly changing its algorithm, often daily, sometimes more than, more than once a day. But I discovered this relatively early, and early counts for a lot on the internet. Um, I'll give you an idea of what I get from having the site well optimized. My traffic comes from a number of different sources, but more than half of it still comes from search engines. I show up well for a lot of topics, and I'll just go through a couple here. My little site in Google search results, and note that I'm not signed in, so there's no personalization. The Google doesn't know who I am, where I've come from. All the cookies have been cleared, so uh, this is just like raw, basic Google. I rank number one for the term office cartoons. We'll have two cartoons and image search above. Number one for sales cartoons. There's three cartoons up there. Number one for technology cartoons, there's two up there. Three for business cartoons. Uh, business cartoons is more competitive, but uh, three is pretty good. I've got two images up there. And I'm number four for medical cartoons. There's just one up there. And these might have changed since I built this. It, it, it often changes based on all kinds of factors. But for the most part, search engines like me. Uh, and one of the reasons is why. Uh, each individual cartoon page isn't just a page where you can buy the cartoon. It also has a lot of information built in for the search engines to read. For example, the caption here, the, uh, the caption is, is obviously part of the image, but that can't be easily read or deciphered by the search engines. So I include the caption uh, down below here in a, a way that they can uh, sink their teeth into. I also list topics and tags from the database. Uh, this particular cartoon is listed under business and office and sales for main topics, but it's also listed under terms like future and ghost for longer tail searches. Now, these are all clickable links that'll take you to more cartoons about that topic or tag. And I mentioned the blog earlier. The blog isn't just for fun, although there's a lot of fun things on the blog. Uh, but I've been doing the blog for almost 10 years now. Uh, and there's a lot of content on there about cartoons to draw traffic in. And hopefully all of that traffic is neatly funneled into my e-commerce. Now, um, I, I, I make buying and downloading cartoons pretty easy. I considered doing a live demo of the e-commerce and, and buying a cartoon right here, but you never know how the internet or the Bluetooth or the connection is, is going to be. Um, however, I'd be happy to do as many live demos later if, as you'd like. Just bring your credit cards. Uh, okay, we'll do a sample purchase step by step. Once you find a cartoon you want to use, you can sign up for a cartoon subscription, or you can choose one of three options to buy the cartoon. I used to have more options. I think I used to have seven options, and I dropped it back down to five, and now I just have three. There's $20, $75, and $100. I found that the fewer options you give, the more you sell. When you click on the option that you want, you just put the cartoon in your cart, like any other, like if you were buying something on Amazon. 
Once you're ready, <coughs> completing the order is quick too. It's just a succession of clicking big orange buttons. Uh, you're taken to a sign-in page. If you have an account, you can sign in and hit the big orange button. Don't have an account or don't want to create an account, you can check out as a guest. Payment page is easy too. If you have an account, most of this information is filled in for you. Uh, once your info is filled in, you again click the big orange button. Orange is my favorite color. And then you're done. That's it. All you do is click download, decide where you want to put the file, and you're good to go. It's five clicks from beginning to end, I think including the download. Uh, I try to keep it as tight a process as possible because the more clicks that you have in a transaction, the more opportunities you give a buyer to click away. As I said, I've got a relatively small amount of traffic, but by making things searchable, optimizing for search engines, and streamlining the purchase process, for the 12 months I mentioned earlier, again, this is from March 2014 to March 2015, I generated more than 1,800 individual e-commerce transactions. That's about five a day. From March to March, I've sold in 46 of the 50 states, the only holdouts being Wyoming, South Dakota, Oklahoma, and Maine. Those four states are on notice. Uh, I've also sold in 24 countries outside the U.S. Now, e-commerce like this accounts for about 50% of my business. The other half comes from custom cartoons. Cartoons are terrific marketing tools for, for businesses uh, and content marketing. And I work with clients to create custom cartoons tailored to their specific needs. And I'll show you just a couple examples here. This was for a tech company for their blog for Valentine's Day. Sheila, will you make me your default? Uh, this is one I did for an insurance agency that caters to teachers. The idea was that you didn't have to pay your deductible if your car got banged up in the teacher parking lot. They wanted to highlight that policy. So these kids are playing basketball in the parking lot. And one of them says, I overheard a teacher saying their insurance covers school parking lot accidents. So we don't need to be so careful at recess anymore. Here's what I did for a law website that wanted to spotlight some new Illinois law changes back in 2014. Things you can no longer do in Illinois in 2014. Talk on your phone while driving. Okay. Drop your cigarette butts on the street. Eh, makes sense. Fly drones around hunters or fishermen. Wait, what? Assume your pension will be there for you. Well, crap. Uh, and then this last one here is one I did for a real estate company. Uh, it looks green. They're not sick, and they're not radioactive. It's just that the company's logo is green, and so they wanted to go with a limited palette. Uh, they were looking for some content for their Facebook page. Everything with a great room is a little outside your budget. Would you consider looking at something with a good enough room? Uh, like I said, custom cartoons are about 50% of my business. So to recap, the things that I did that worked well are searchability, SEO, e-commerce, and custom cartoons. I think, though, that even more important are the things that I tried that didn't work, and I'll just go through a couple of the really fantastic failures. Let's begin with uh, syndication. My first trip was one I called Smart Alex. It was about a young married couple. This was before we had kids. Uh, here's a sample. They're, uh, they're shopping, and the wife says, ooh, tuna's on sale. The husband says, you ever notice that tuna fish and cat food come in the same, exact same can? I wonder if anyone's ever mixed up the label. Sure, cats wouldn't mind, but... And she gives him a dirty look, and she says, you know... If you don't want tuna noodle casserole, you could have just say that. He goes, meow, 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 meow. Yeah, it's not a great cartoon. They were right to reject it. My second strip was one called Hackles. This one was about a guy and his dog, but their roles were kind of reversed. The dog was the responsible one that went to work every day, and the guy was more the pet. He laid at home and watched TV and ate all the food and got in trouble. Here's a sample of that. The dog's coming home. Hey, I'm home. The new issue of Persons Come? Yep, on the counter. How do you stomach that junk? 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 I'll have you know that each and every issue is filled with fascinating celebrities and their amazing triumphs and tribulations and their cute little French poodles. Oh, <laughs> bonjour, mon chéri. Yeah, that one wasn't that good either. Uh, my last one was Laughter, Rinse, Repeat. It was taking uh, some existing gag cartoons and redrawing them in a panel format. Here's an example. Uh, there's some pretty bad shading in this one, too. Uh, I understand you'll be scattering the remains on a baked ziti. Uh, I did get some really nice rejection letters from the, uh, from the syndicates. Uh, Amy Lago told me there's some very good stuff here. I always had some suggestions to make it more saleable. 
Jay Kennedy gave me some, probably like my favorite rejection. He said, very funny. Art is professional, but a bit generic. He's right. Uh, you're a talented writer, and good writers are rarer than good artists. So you see, that's not so bad. And it turned out OK in the end. I called John Glynn up one day at Go Comics. And it, wasn't, uh, it was just a couple days later, and we had a deal hammered out. And I'm kind of syndicated there now. So another way I failed absolutely more completely was with The New Yorker. I submitted forever and never got so much as a nibble. Collected plenty of these guys. And honestly, you know what? It's just not a good fit. The kind of gag I think I would have to create uh, and write and draw there, I don't think I'd be able to sell a lot of other places. I also failed at t-shirts. My wife, uh, I made her spend, uh, she's a t-shirt, and she took an entire summer to put together this store for me, to sell t-shirts with my cartoons on them. Uh, it was terrible. I think I made 50 bucks. It was, it was not a, a tremendous success. I also tried books and mini comics. I printed up a few different collections and tried selling them at SPX. Uh, I got to hang out with some good friends, and I kind of broke even, but again, it's not worth it. I also tried selling them on the website, uh, but lately, or quickly realized that packing them and signing them and putting in the stamps on them and putting them in the mailbox and for a, like a dollar profit on each of them was just was not worth it. So let's see where else Marcus failed. Facebook. When this was a thing, when, when you could do like Facebook apps, I'm not sure if you can do them anymore. I don't think so. I think they killed it. I spent a couple of thousand dollars making a Facebook app that would have my cartoons on it. Uh, that never went anywhere. And to be fair, I didn't really try very hard because I don't like Facebook. Uh, probably my biggest failure was art fairs. I spent a good year planning and preparing for this. I sold, what I sold were like little cartoon collections for like two, three dollars each. I think they were three dollars. And then I sold matted prints of cartoons and then I sold framed originals. And I had done all of my research, and nobody was doing anything like this, right? It was all wooden bowls and planes made out of beer cans and all kinds of stuff. For the most part, what would happen was people would walk up, they'd read the books, they'd laugh, they'd show them to their friends, they'd look at the prints, they'd say, oh, oh, this is great, oh, you need to look at this one, this is fantastic. And they'd laugh, and they'd talk, and they'd show it all around, and then they would walk away. And I was like, Come, it's like $3. You were here for 20 minutes. The book, uh, it was really fresh. And the weather was horrible. It was terrible. Dude, like, you had to sit in a tent for days at a time. And like, I would sit on asphalt in a bright white tent in like 95 degree weather and like high humidity. And there was one time where it was 60 mile an hour winds and I had to zip up the tent and hold into the top of it. I was also flooded. Uh, I had uh, water up to almost up to my knees, which wasn't as bad. Like, the tent was made of these giant metal poles, and then when the lightning started, and I was in knee-deep water with a 10-foot <laughs> metal pole under a tree, I was, like, so sure that I was going to die that day. It was a terrible, terrible thing. So while there were, uh, there were plenty of things that didn't work, right? And so it would appear on the surface that Mark's fancy philosophy might have let him down, right? The guy's not so smart. But there were things that I learned from each failure that focused me or moved me forward. Syndication. I'm a good writer, but I think I write better short. I don't think I, I write, if you can call a strip long form writing, I think I write much better in just one panel. Uh, the New Yorker, I just finally learned to stop beating my head against that wall and to focus on finding customers that were a better fit for me. The New Yorker was never going to be a good fit. Uh, t-shirts, uh, don't make your wife spend an entire summer creating a t-shirt store unless you're pretty sure it's going to work. Mini comics, I don't think self-publishing is my strong point. Facebook, decide what everybody will tell you. Sometimes social media isn't the answer. It often is not. In art fairs, what I learned was people do not want to buy cartoons from sweaty, surly men. <laughs> they just don't. So it turns out for me, at least, that this philosophy of figuring out where to start and discovering how little I know, not being afraid to try something, anything, even though failure is not only an option, but entirely probable, and then analyzing the results and doing it all over again, as short and as simple and as basic as this seems, helped me to build a business selling my cartoons online that this kid from Iowa 30 years ago would not have thought possible. 
So thank you again. I hope you enjoy the book in your bags, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have.